Sickler would take the latter half of this. Um, but basically, I just kind of want to invite you into my world for the next 10 minutes or so. So criminology, we study crime and offending patterns. And I think, like many scientists, we like things for, um, for things to be mutually exclusive, right? No overlapping, everything fits very neatly into a box that makes our job so much easier. Um, clearly, not always the case. And so, actually, the last um, five-ish years have been, for me, looking at overlap amongst different types of multi-side offenders. So, as researchers, we like to focus on how groups are different. My research is actually looking at how groups are different and similar. So this is a table just showing the numbers of serial killers that I have in my data set, um, as well as mass murderers. Just gonna throw this out to the crowd. Anyone notice anything super obvious about this data? <laughs> Mostly men. Mostly solo men, sure. And so these are offenders, so um, not by case. What else do we see? Serial is higher than mass. And there's reasons for that, definitions usually. What about this? What do you think's going on there? Potentially. Relationship based serial killing versus non relation relationship based like mass murders. So if I were to say to you, generally speaking, we know that serial killers don't want to be caught. Generally speaking, we know that mass murderers are probably not going to survive the incident that they perpetrate. What does this tell you? It's going to be harder to get a partner to agree to commit suicide <laughs> at the end of that result versus someone who's like, well, no, we'll get away with it. We can kill all these people and they'll never catch us and they'll write about us till the end of time and we'll be famous, right? So whenever I have questions like these, I usually reply, rely on apprentices. And so thank you to the Office of Academic Research. I've had 13 in my time here at Norwich, students, not surprisingly, fascinated by these topics. But every time I have a research question, for me to go into my data to come up with searching all of those open sources to fill in that variable takes time, time that I don't have. Thankfully, our students do a little bit, and they get paid, and this is a valuable experience for them. So when um, Ali mentioned, you know, we had this project to invite faculty into um, the AI world, the original idea was to incorporate AI into my uh, CRIM 316 violent crime class. So we spend a week on homicide, a week on robbery, a week on rape and sexual assault, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because I'm a homicide expert, and homicide is supposed to be the most accurate data, we decided to start there. And so what Rachel needs is data. So I was like, well, we have the UCR, which the FBI collects, has um, police-driven data. We have things like the NCBS, victim-reported data. We also have the CDC, public health data, that has mortality statistics. And it started to, started to get you know, big, but not quite what we were really looking for. So one day, mentioned this is what I study, and Rachel said, you know, well, there should be a data set on serial murder that we can go to um, as, a, as a starting point. And I said, well, funny enough, Rachel, I have one. I've been working on it for 20 years. That was that data set here. Um, it's international, covers 1900 to present day. But I haven't shared it with anyone because it's a work in progress. So Rachel said, great. So shared the data set. She started looking through it, cleaning it. There's another researcher, Mike Abbott, who's a professor emeritus out of um, University, or Radford University, who, if you Google him, he's kind of the go-to. He presents mostly case studies, so it's like a PDF file. And so Rachel, we agreed, reached out to him. He shared his data. So now we have two major data sets on serial murder. The next part of that conversation was I reached out and I said, hey Mike, what if we merged our data sets? And we became the most accurate, robust source 
on serial murder that's available, which means any grad student, so for me, I have to start from scratch, any three-letter agency, anyone who's interested in serial murder will have this one place to go. So he's currently talking with his collaborators in Florida. We're hoping to get a yes. He seems very intrigued. But that's kind of how this process has developed. I also just want to point out, um, criminologists know, to, know how to do some of the hard statistics also. Um, so this is kind of an analysis from my research that shows um, basically mass murderers five times more likely to use firearms and then those who use firearms are about 2.5 times um, less likely to survive their attack. So what does this mean? This again goes back to that looking at comparisons amongst different groups. And with this one, it's looking at those who attempt or complete suicide as ways to potentially predict and prevent crime, right? So if we know that mass murderers are not likely to survive their attacks, we should be looking at suicide type behaviors. Are they giving away valuable goods? Are they saying their goodbyes to close friends? These are the kinds of things that if we have a large data set, it enhances our model, it strengthens our model, and also allows us to look at other types of offenders. Um, so we're hoping to apply this process with serial murder to other types of predatory offenders like human traffickers, and then also looking at those other modules in my criminal violence class with robbery, rape, sexual assault, um, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so I guess the question now is we have these data sets, um, and Elizabeth mentioned it was sort of, Jeff used the word, a grassroots effort where we were looking at one thing and, and we realized that we had a better thing over here. Um, so the, the first challenge here is, is taking these data sets and, and making and merging them together, uh, finding a way to clean the data, to validate the data that we have, clean the data that we got, and validate the data that we got, and then make one master data set. And actually, we have an additional data set that we did some web scraping for from one of the resources that um, the apprentices use, and we'll also you know, mine that for some text data and make a data set out of that clean it, validate it, and merge it in to make it this master data set. We plan to use um, AI to make this data set more robust, um, to make it more complete. Um, and and after, after we, we have all these data sets together, we need to start looking at where are things missing. There's definitely going to be things within each of these observations that are missing fields. Um, and the question is, how, how do you start finding that missing information? So right now, the apprentices uh, use a lot of you know, Googling. <laughs> they, they have some resources that they go to first. Um, so we'll start you know, using the Google API and doing keyword searches and looking at some of the resources that they commonly go to to try and pinpoint where this information might be. We'll, we'll be able to do some information extraction, doing some NLP techniques there, doing some similarity scores. Um, and pointing apprentices to where they should be reading within these articles to get us the fields that we're looking for, but um, we'll also be able to, to, to fill in these fields, some of them, through these processes and just allow the apprentices to come in and say, yes, that's right, or no, that's wrong. Um, and at the end of the day, we'll be able to make a new logistic regression model with our, with our bigger data set and, and, and use this as a baseline to see if we've gained more insights or we know about our data. Thank you. Thank you.